Well, good afternoon, everybody. How are you doing? Good. I have a couple of announcements for you today. Uh, if you did not grab an insert on your way in, grab one um, when you leave. There's some important things in here this week. Uh, first off, I shared with you last week that we've got a new women's ministry that's launching soon. So there's information in here on that. It's going to be the second Friday of the month, uh, starting in November. So uh, we would love to know that you're coming to that. So if you're interested, you can go onto our website, or if you have the Church Center app, uh, if you don't, you can download it, select City Church as your church, uh, and then just let us know. There's a, it's a request to join, um, and that way you'll get some information. We'll see that you're interested, and we'll be able to give you some information about, you know, what to bring, what that looks like. Um, the other thing, I told you last week that we weren't going to talk about Christmas because we weren't close enough to Christmas, and then it snowed this week, right? Uh, so we're going to talk about Christmas a little bit. Uh, on November 18th, it's a Saturday, we're going to be here decorating the facility. How many people that are here tonight were here last week, last year when we did that? All right, so a, a good number. Um, well, it's it's kind of like light cleanup, make the place look better. And we would ask you to bring some boxes of varying sizes and a donation of Christmas wrapping paper. And then we, we kind of use that as a foundation for decorating all around the church. Plus, we've got some lights and some trees, and uh, so, you know, plan to get down into the basement and dig some of those things out for us. Um, and it's a lot of fun, and we're going to do a hot chocolate bar this year, so, um, you know, bring, bring kids, have a good time uh, as we decorate, make the place look good. So that's coming up. It'll be 3 p.m. on November 18th. Um, finally, the uh, Madison building. We have been talking a lot about that, what we've been doing over there. We've been making progress uh, we've, uh, this week though, we're going to take this week off. So if you've been thinking about coming on Tuesday nights at 5.30, don't come this week. Uh, but you can come the next week. And I will say next week will be the first week where we're into some heavier construction stuff. There will still be things for people to do if you're like, I've never done anything like that before. We can put you somewhere and say, hey, just com complete this project. And we've got tools if you don't have tools um, and even if you don't want to do that, we've had some people say, well, I can't really do construction, but I can clean. You know, I could come into this building and clean something or whatever. That's fine, too. We just want it to be a community. And so we get together at 530. We eat. We have a devotional time. And then we, we split off and we get to work on various projects. So it's a good time just to get your, get your hands dirty with uh, other people who are part of the City Church family. So not this Tuesday because it's Halloween but uh, beyond. Um, and then the last thing is, you'll see on here, service project in the middle of your page. Um, we're going to be uh, helping out um, someone in the church who's getting their house ready to, to move in. Um, and so uh, talk to Will Haley. He's not here tonight, um, but we've got a couple of weeks to be able to set this up. If you're interested in helping with, with cleaning and hauling and construction stuff, um, this is a service project that's coming up on November 12th. It'll probably be like a uh, four to six hours on, on Saturday in the morning. So mark your calendar for that. We'll have more information when Will's back next week. Uh, but if you know Will, you can shoot him a message um, or you can go online. He's our small groups director, so his contact information is there too. Uh, you can get a hold of him that way. Uh, with that, I'm gonna open us in prayer and then uh, I'm gonna invite us all to stand and sing together. God, uh, thank you. Lord, thank you for the gift of salvation that brings us together, that unites us together under this banner that we call Christianity. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'll be with us tonight as we worship you. Be with us tonight as we fellowship with one another. Uh, be with us as we celebrate what we learn in your word tonight. Inspire us, God, and help make us more like you. It would be awesome, Lord, if every Sunday when we left this place, we were more like you than when we got here. So God, that's what we ask tonight. Make us more like you. Reveal your face to us in a way, Lord, that allows us to 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 see you better, God, in a way that, that we can worship you more deeply. Lord, we love you. We lift you up in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, let's stand up together as we uh, worship.
don't you get shy on me lift up your song because you've got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the lord oh come on my soul oh don't you get shy on me lift up your song because you've got a
religion my soul needs a friend so i'll run to the father again and again i run to the father i fall into grace i'm done with the hiding no reason to wait my heart found a surgeon my soul found a friend so i'll run to the father kids left in here, you are dismissed to go. Um, I'm going to do something a little different this week than I do most weeks. Uh, I'm going to give you the end of the message right at the beginning. Uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you the punchline before I tell you the joke. Uh, so there's no confusion about where we're going. I want to, it's, it's an important thing for us to remember, okay? So remember this, God can use the ordinary to do the extraordinary. Okay, say that with me. God can use the ordinary to do the extraordinary. Do you believe that? Okay, well, we're going to talk about that a little bit. God can use the ordinary to do the extraordinary. Um, this is what I want you to remember. This is uh, what I want you to say if somebody says, oh, hey, what'd you do this weekend? And you say, oh, I went to church. Oh, great. What church uh, do you go to? I went to city church, and what's it like? Oh, it's a little weird, but it's, it's my kind of church. I like I like that church, and uh, cool, what, what did you guys learn? We learned that God can use the ordinary to do the extraordinary. I want you to remember that. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 2 of uh, Philippians today, so if you brought your Bible, you can turn there. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up uh, chapter 2. We've been in Philippians so far, it's, this is week number 5. I don't know if it feels longer or shorter, uh, but at Thanksgiving, we'll be pivoting into a series for Advent for the Christmas season. But uh, today, we are, uh, we're talking about joy. We're continuing to talk about this joy ride that we're all on uh, called life um, and, and how we can have joy in a variety of situations, good and bad. Uh, we've talked already about how, um, how uh, pursuing God together uh, can bring us joy. When we have somebody riding shotgun with us, it, it can bring us joy. We've talked about uh, how we really can find joy even when the world around us forces us to stop. When we end up in a place where we're, we're stuck in traffic and we don't want to be there, we can still have joy in that place. We talked a couple weeks ago about how, how to find the on-ramp to joy. If God's will is is the will that we want to follow, if God's direction is the direction that we want to go, how do we get on that, that highway? How do we find that on-ramp? And then last week, we talked about the principles of defensive driving and how it's not something that we just apply to our physical lives. It's something that we can apply to our spiritual lives, too, that we can be on the lookout for hazards, for obstacles, for any other thing that could impact our journey in a negative way. And today, we're talking about how God can use the ordinary to do the extraordinary. And that's something that should bring us a great deal of joy. If it doesn't, I hope by the end of the evening, it, it will. Uh, this passage of scripture that we're looking at today from Philippians 2, um, I, I just want to tell you up front, it's going to be more of a secondary scripture to the message. Um, I like to dive deeply into scripture, to dissect it, to unpack it, and this is a passage that's a, it's a little bit more difficult to do w with a passage um, l like this. This isn't a passage of scripture that most people choose to, to memorize or to recall during difficult 
times. This isn't something that people share with one another as inspiration during times of trouble. Remember, this is a letter that Paul's writing while he's in, in prison. Um, but this portion of the letter, while we find a lot of inspiration in the letter, without trying to be blasphemous in any way, in any way we're going to talk about how the Bible is the inspired, inspired word, word of God and what that means a little bit later. Um, but Again, without being blasphemous, I want to say that this is a passage of Scripture that, compared to some of the other passages that we've read, it's less inspirational, inspirational and it's a little more of what I would call ordinary. It's, it's an ordinary part of, of, of a letter, if you were to write a letter to someone. It's not the most memorable part. So it's not going to be the focal point for our study today on how God can, can use uh, the ordinary to do the extraordinary. So I just wanted to say that right, right off the bat. Um, let's read the passage together, and you'll see, you'll see what I mean. This is from Philippians 2, uh, beginning in verse 19. I hope, this is the, Paul uh, finishing chapter 2, writing to the Philippian church. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him soon as I see, uh, as I see how things go with me. Remember, Paul's in prison, probably uh, expecting to die here any day. Um, and I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. So while death is at his door, he's still looking ahead to what God would do for him if God protects him from, from this imminent death. Uh, but I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not only uh, on him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be, be glad, <clears throat> and I may have less anxiety. We're getting to the end, don't worry. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Um, and that last part sounds like a little bit of a dig. It's not, and, and we'll discuss why. Um, okay, anyone ever recited this passage to anybody during a difficult time in their lives? <laughs> yes? Okay, well, we're going to talk after because I want to know what that's about. It's not a common one, right? It's not one that many of us uh, commit to memory. But I do think it's important for us to look at it because, again, if the Bible is the inspired word of God, if every word in the Bible is something that we believe that, that God said, we want to understand the, the purpose. Um, <clears throat> one, you may have noticed that, uh, that this message today is titled Model T, and then in parentheses there's an and E, and I want to explain that a little bit. First, this series is called Joyride. So we've been using uh, illustrations uh, from the, the automob automobile industry. We've been talking about on-ramps, and we've been talking about uh, people riding shotgun in our vehicles and, and those sort of things. Um, the Model T, uh, if you're not aware, was one of the first cars that was available to the masses. It was one of the first mass-produced pro affordable cars in the early 1900s, 1906, 1907, um, and it was a car that was kind of for everyone. And we would look at it as, as being ordinary or even being extraordinary in a simple way now because of our understanding of, uh, of technology and transportation and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and just once again, I've said this the past couple of weeks, we've had some issues with our lights and we haven't quite figured them out yet. So if it just goes fully dark for a minute and then comes back up, just try to ignore it or just go, hey, maybe they're doing something special for Halloween uh, that's not what it is, but if we want to turn them down and turn them back up, uh, turn them off, turn them back on, then maybe that'll make a difference. We don't, we don't really know. Hopefully we can get this figured out soon because it just started happening a couple of weeks ago. Um, so apologies to people online who now can't see anything, uh, and apologies to, to you guys too for having to deal with the, uh, the epileptic st strobe that happens sometimes. Hopefully we get it figured out soon. Um, so, uh, back to the Model T, I don't know if you just want to turn the house lights on because it would be a distraction otherwise. We'll just, we'll just run with that. Um, back to the Model T. Uh, 
Henry Ford took an ordinary idea, and the, or, the idea was we want to go from place to place. We want to go from point A to point B. Yeah, it's weird. We turn them off, and they still go. Uh, all right, we should be good now, right? Okay, we'll see. The breaker is off now to the lights, so if we have lights, we're all just going to start praying because it's going to be a weird thing that's happening in this place. But um, No, Henry Ford took an ordinary idea like transportation. How do I get from point A to point B? B, and he did something pretty extraordinary with it because what people wanted at the time were, were faster horses. They wanted to get from point A to point B faster in the way that they've been traveling. But he did something different and, and laid the foundation for the whole travel industry in a way that, that maybe we even take for granted. Like yesterday morning, I woke up uh, with my wife in a hotel in Minneapolis, and then I flew here. Uh, and that's crazy because that's a couple thousand miles away. We knew, I don't mean to say like we, we woke up and didn't know how we got there. We, go, we went there on purpose. Uh, but, but yesterday we came back and we went a couple thousand miles and anymore, that's just not a really big deal, right? Like most people have gotten on a plane and flown from place to place, but it's an ordinary idea carried out to an extraordinary degree. It's traveling from one point to another done in, a, in an extraordinary way. So I, I wanted to use the Model T as an example for that. That this is just something that at the time was an extraordinary way of doing an ordinary thing. Uh, the other reason that this message is called uh, Model T and E is because we just were introduced to a couple of people, Timothy and Epaphrodite, Epaphroditus, and their names begin with the letter T and E. Uh, it's a funny coincidence for me because my oldest son is named Timothy, uh, and we call him T. He's a 26-year-old married man who lives on his own, and we still call him T, because that's what we've called him since he was born. We've just called him T. And you, you're not going to believe this, but my other son, his name is not Epaphroditus. We don't see a lot of little Epaphroditus, Epaphrodite, Epaphrodite. What's the plural of Epaphroditus, anyway? I don't know, because we just don't have a lot of those in our, in our culture. But my younger son is named Ethan, and so we have a T and an E. And while we don't call Ethan E, uh, we do refer to him that way. When we're talking to family, we'll say, oh yeah, Becky and I and T and E. When we sign Christmas cards from, from Pete and Becky and T and E. It's just what we do. So this passage is kind of endearing to me for that reason. So the title of this, series, this sermon is a little bit for, for me, selfish, which I get to do because I'm the pastor. Uh, we don't learn a lot about Timothy and Epaphroditus from this passage of Scripture. We learn a, li a little. <clears throat> we learn that Paul trusts Timothy. We learn that Timothy has proved himself to Paul, and that Paul is going to send Timothy to the Philippians. But may, maybe you caught this, and maybe you didn't. We also learned that Paul expects that they would send him back. Uh, see, these, these journeys weren't terribly safe. But he says, hey, you, you go, Timothy's going to go to you. I'm in prison. I'm going to send Timothy to you. And then uh, he's, he's going to come back to me. I'm going to be cheered when, uh, when I receive news of, the, of you, of the Philippian church. So he's going to send Timothy. Uh, Timothy's going to share some time with them, share about their experiences, and then Timothy's going to come back. But Epaphroditus was in a different category. Epaphroditus was sent to Paul by the Philippian church. He calls him your messenger, Epaphroditus. I'm going to send him back to you. And we learned that while he was with Paul, he became gravely ill he, he recovered, and now he's sending him back to his people. So he spends some time doing this missionary thing with, uh, with, with Paul, and now he's going to send him back. So these guys are traveling together, but they're going to end up in different places. Something we might miss if we're not paying attention. Um, nothing in anything that we just read gives us any impression that Timothy and Epaphroditus were extraordinary people. We didn't read anything that tells us that they're anything more than ordinary. They're ordinary young men in pursuit of a, a God who loved people in an abnormal way, in an extraordinary way. So in a way, Timothy and Epaphroditus were no different than you or me. I think we have a bad habit inside of the Christian church of putting uh, people like Timothy, Epaphroditus, Paul, the disciples anyone not named Jesus, on a pedestal. And uh, we, we, we think that they are extraordinary in some way. But they weren't. They were ordinary people. Now, did, did they potentially have some skills that you, didn't have, that you don't have? Sure. 
Are they potentially better than you at some of the things that, that you can do? Yeah, but I bet you're better at some things too. I bet they would look at you, Paul and Peter and John and Luke and all of these people that we read about in the Bible that we, re- we revere. I bet some of those people would go, wow, you're really good at. And there would be something that they would, that they would herald you for being able to do. And uh, what that means is that we all fit into this bandwidth of humanity, right? There's none of us, while there are some gifted people among us, and while everybody here is gifted at something, we all fall into this bandwidth of what we would call ordinary people. Our, Our differences, while we celebrate them, they don't necessarily make us extraordinary in the same kind of way that we would apply that term to Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about that word, extraordinary? It's modified ordinary, extraordinary. And we have a couple of other words inside of the English language that are modified in a a similar way. Extracurricular means beyond the curricular, outside of the curriculum. So after school sports, if you have, anybody have kids in junior high, high school, even elementary these days? Yeah. So you know there's extracurricular activities that they can be in, involved in, right? They can, they can do sports, they can do clubs, they can do band, they can do that kind of stuff. Or before school, you join a weight training class or, or you know, some music thing. There are things that you can do that you don't need to do to get your degree. They're extra to the curriculum. So extracurricular is a word that we use. Extraterrestrial is another word that we use to describe something that's outside of our, our terra, terraform, our earth, outside of our atmosphere, um, in theology, we have a word that we use uh, inside of Christianity called extra-biblical. That means what you would think it means, outside of the Bible. And there are some positive extra-biblical sources, and there are some negative extra-biblical sources. We do believe that the Bible, like I mentioned earlier, is the inspired word of God. And what that means is that it's the word of God as if it was spoken, written down through the hands of, of, of men to the hands of people in in history, as if God was speaking these things. That's how we herald all of these letters and history books and books of poetry and prophetic books, all of these these combination of things that make up the canon of, of the Bible. But as much as we revere the Bible, as much as it is the word of God and the only place we can go to find the written word of God in a, in a way that we can trust implicitly, extra biblical sources can teach us an awful lot about God too. They can teach us about the history of Jesus Christ. You can read from people like Josephus and others who were alive in that first generation after Christ and they, they can talk about how Christ was crucified on a cross and, and we get these extra biblical sources that help us understand what's going on in that day and that age a little bit better, help us put things in line a little bit better. So uh, again, without minimizing the Bible, because that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to put the Bible on a pedestal, but I'm trying to suggest that there are other books and other sources, testimonies of other people that have been captured and written down that we can read that help us hold up the Bible that much better. It it puts it into our framework of understanding in in an easier way sometimes. So that's another one of those words, extra, uh, extra biblical. So Extracurricular, outside of the curriculum, extraterrestrial, outside of our atmosphere, extra biblical, beyond the Bible or outside of the, the, the Bible. And then the, our word for today, extraordinary, outside of or beyond the ordinary. If I were to guess, uh, I would imagine that most of our lives are filled with ordinary things. That if you were to make a list of what happened when you woke up today and every event that happened from that point on, very few, if any, of the things that you put on your list would be what we call extraordinary. Would you agree? Okay, for the most part. Um, But is God an ordinary God? Or is God an extraordinary God? He's an extraordinary God. God. We have normal, ordinary experiences, but it's almost impossible for us to comprehend the extraordinary nature of God because it's, it's ironic. It's a little bit of a catch-22. The ordinary state of God is extraordinary. It's normal for God to be abnormally gracious, abnormally loving, abnormally kind, abnormally ch- charitable, abnormally 
generous. And there's nothing else inside of our world that operates in the same way. Because if, if that were the normal state, we would just call it ordinary. But God is not ordinary, yet his ordinary, straight, uh, his ordinary state is an extraordinary state. It, it's tough to wrap our minds around. And because it's impossible, I would say beyond tough, it's impossible for us to wrap our minds fully around this idea that normal for God is a state of being extraordinary. Because that's the case, God uses all sorts of ordinary things through the Bible and through in our world to help us understand how extraordinary he is. Think back to the time of, of Exodus. God used a shepherd's staff a shaped chunk of wood in the hands of a man named Moses to do miraculous things before the most powerful person in the land, Pharaoh, as he was calling for the freedom of the Israelites in in captivity at the hands of the Egyptians. And he takes that staff, and at one point, he throws it down, and it turns into a snake, and it eats these other snakes. And then there's another time where he takes this wooden staff, and he touches the tip of it to the water, and the the entire river, as far as they can see, turns to blood. This is an ordinary wooden staff that God used to do extraordinary, miraculous things. In the book of Joshua, God uses something else ordinary. He uses the horn of a ram. It's the horn of a ram. Like it's, it's, there's nothing special about this thing, but he uses it like a trumpet along with the voices of ordinary people just walking around a wall to collapse the city of Jericho, an extraordinarily fortituted city. A crazy thing that he would use something like a, like a horn of a ram, an ordinary horn of a ram to do this. In the book of uh, Judges, we read the story of Gideon, who was a, a, a judge. Uh, he was a warrior. He was a leader of people, of the early Israelites. And God uses a fleece, which is another way of saying like a blanket, uh, to confirm to Gideon what he should do. He's not sure so he says, God, do this. And so on the next day, God, God makes everything wet and the fleece is completely dry. And then Gideon's still not sure. So on the next day, God makes everything dry and the, fle- the fleece is completely wet. It's an ordinary blanket that God used to do something or- extraordinary. He speaks through that thing in an extraordinary way. Speaking of speaking, God uses a talking donkey in the book of Numbers, to get a man named Balaam to understand that he, he's about to make a bad decision. Talking donkeys aren't ordinary outside of Shrek. It's the only place that we see that happening in today's society. And there are so many more ordinary things that God uses in extraordinary ways. He uses a jawbone in the hands of Samson to slay a thousand enemies. He uses a, a stone in the hands in the sling of a man named, a boy named David who killed a giant named Goliath. He uses oil in the story of Elisha, a prophet that replenishes itself night after night so, so that God's provision can be taught through that story. God uses pottery and rivers and torches and bears and coats and bread and fish. All ordinary things to show us the extraordinary things he's capable of. That extraordinary is God's ordinary default setting. But it's not just about things. Like if you were to go through your your life, if you were to go through your world and some extraordinary thing like anything we just talked about happened, it would be hard to deny that 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 was an extraordinary, there's some sort of extraordinary divine intervention that's going on in this way if we were to see something like that. But God doesn't stop there with, with items and objects. God uses people too, ordinary people in extraordinary ways. People like Noah who built an ark and kind of re- relaunched humanity in the world. People like Abraham and Sarah who were way too old to have kids, but through them he built an entire nation. People like Moses who stuttered and stammered yet still was able to speak in a way that, that negotiated the Israelites' freedom. Esther was an orphan. Jonah was a coward. Rahab was a prostitute. Paul, the author of this book and so many of the other New Testament letters, Uh, was an enemy of Christ, an extraordinary enemy of Christ. He went to great lengths to to confound the mission of the, the early Christian church. Yet, despite the ordinary nature of all of these people involved here, God still used every single one of them to do extraordinary things in his name. 
If we were to return to Philippians 2, we could read a little bit more about, about Timothy and what he meant to Paul, and we could read more about that in some of the other letters that Paul has, has written. But there's less in the Bible that's said about this man Epaphroditus. We, we actually only see his name twice in the entire Bible. We see it here, where we just read it in chapter 2, and then we see it at the very end of, of the, the book of uh, the Philippians, this letter to the Philippian church. Um, but it's interesting because even the fact that God is using this man named Epaphroditus is something that's pretty extra, extraordinary. Uh, he was, uh, Epaphroditus was probably Greek, and his, he was named after a Greek god. His name means belonging to Aphrodite. So Epaphroditus' parents expected that he would belong to the, the, the pantheon of Greek gods. Aphrodite was the, the daughter of Zeus. She was the goddess of beauty, fertility, and sexuality. And so it's a weird thing, I think, to name your, your son, but okay, that's what they, they did. Uh, they probably didn't expect that he would live out his life in pursuit of another god outside of their pantheon, but, but he did. It was an ordinary name among the Greeks, Yet God pivoted him and his mission. And through that pivot, Epaphroditus was able to do extraordinary things alongside of Paul. Epaphroditus wasn't extraordinary, not on his own. And he was never intended to be extraordinary in, in the way that God made him that way. But he was because of his pursuit of God. Uh, the same can be said for Timothy. We, we know that Timothy was young, he had stomach problems. Uh, he accompanied Paul on quite a few of his missionary journeys. We know that Paul speaks about Timothy as a father speaks about his son. But it's interesting. You know, we never see Timothy do any miracles. We never see Timothy do any, any miraculous things. We never see Timothy stand up and preach in any sort of miraculous way where, where he speaks something that leads an entire battalion of people to Christ. We see that in the Bible a number of times, but we don't see that with Timothy Timothy was just a guy, just a young guy who wanted to honor God, honor Paul, and honor God by doing what he'd learned from the law, from the, the word, from the stories about Jesus Christ, and from Paul, his mentor. He wasn't doing anything abnormal. He was doing an, o an ordinary thing, and through that obedience to God, in an ordinary way, he became someone extraordinary. Now, remember our message for today. God can use the ordinary to do the extraordinary. Uh, it's easy, I think, to get bogged down with this idea that we are too ordinary for God to use to do extraordinary things through. Isn't it? Don't you feel that way sometimes? God, how's God going to use me? You know who else I think probably felt that way? Epaphroditus. And Timothy, and Paul, and the rest of the disciples. It's, it's normal to feel that way. It's ordinary for us to feel that way, which is why I know that you've probably felt that way before. We know that all of these people were surprised to be used by God in the way that he chose to use them. I know that we all feel too ordinary sometimes to be used by God. I know that I do. I struggle with, am, am I good enough? Am I doing the, the right things? Am I doing them for the right reasons? And I get all twisted up inside of my own head. I fall prey to the lie, get this, the lie that God wants you to be extraordinary because God doesn't want you to be extraordinary. God wants to make you extraordinary. See, if we pursue extraordinary things, we may find extraordinary things for ourselves, but they are far less than an ordinary life of faithful pursuit of Christ and the extraordinary things that God does when we pursue him in that way. We shouldn't be pursuing extraordinary. We should be pursuing Christ and letting Christ work out how extraordinary you are. And I do believe that God makes us that way. He just isn't calling us to strive for that. He wants us to call him to make us that, to transform our ordinary, this ordinary vessel that each of us call our lives into some extraordinary thing in a way that only he can do. And all that he asks of us is to be obedient. 
to be committed, to do what we talked about last week. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. To trust that God really is who he says he is. That God has done all the things that he said he would do. That he really does love us enough to die in our place for our sake, for our sin. God is extraordinary. God did something extraordinary. And all that he asks us to do in response is to recognize that he did those things, that he is extraordinary, that God loves us in an extraordinary way, and that through faith, God's extraordinary attributes can be revealed to us, even though we are ordinary people. There's a passage uh, from another one of Paul's letters, a letter to the Corinthian church, where um, he reminds us of this fact in uh, a little bit greater detail. He says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. God chose the foolish to shame the wise. God chose the the weak to shame the strong. And God chose the ordinary to do the extraordinary. And all that God asks in return for that to happen in our lives is that we would honor him, that we would glory him, that we would return praise to him for doing extraordinary things with ordinary people like us. And that brings us back to where we started in the beginning. God can use the ordinary to do the extraordinary. Here's the question that I have for you. Is God doing extraordinary things in your life? Okay, I know that most of us believe that he is. Are we experiencing them? Are we witnesses to them? Do we see them on on a regular basis? Are we participating with the extraordinary things that God is doing? If God's default setting is extraordinary, then it should be undeniable for all of us, shouldn't it? We should always be able to see the extraordinary nature of God. Yet, things get in the way. Sometimes we know it, but we have a hard time enacting it in our lives. Part of that is because of how we see extraordinary things done. Uh, I want to talk about a few of the ways that that we, we see those things happen. First, the greatest way, the grandest way that we see God do extraordinary things is through what we would call miracles. We, we see God do something miraculous. Uh, maybe you've seen God do a miraculous thing before. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I can't say for sure that I have. Um, I've been around people. I know people who were there when somebody died and they prayed and then the person wasn't dead anymore or like a body part was cut off and then immediately it had grown back. And those are all stories that I'd heard and I'm like, wow, that's kind of crazy. Uh, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And it would be crazy to see something like it, too. I know people who've experienced those things, and largely they've, they've seen those things on the mission field in, in, in other countries. Um, but, it's, but those are miracles. Those are things that we see, and, and when, we, when we see those things, we go, God is at work. It's undeniable because that limb was on the floor, and now it's back or it's still on the floor, and there's a new one in its place, and I don't know what to do uh, about that. Like, our brains kind of explode when we see some of that stuff. I've never experienced anything like that, but um, I will say there have been a couple times in my life where I've experienced God working or moving or speaking in a way where I I can only describe it as extraordinary or miraculous. Um, I have no other words to, to describe that. If you've ever been in any kind of charismatic circle, sometimes that can be the case. You know, and I'm not a big... Uh, I'm not a big charismatic guy. I'm not, a, I'm not a big tongue speaker, right? Like it's not part of my daily life, but I've been in places before. I've been in some really questionable situations before where some of that stuff's happening, uh, but I've also been places where I'm sitting back and, 
And just as a natural skeptic, I'm looking and I'm watching and I'm experiencing the presence of God in a way that's undeniable. And I go, wow, this is a miraculous thing that's happening when a hundred people are speaking and I can hear everyone and I can understand everyone, even though they're not all talking in, in English. I know they're not because those people don't know English. And I know that because I met them yesterday. Like, there's experiences like that that I've had that I go, wow, it's kind of undeniable that God is extraordinary when God does something extraordinary like that. But it's probably the least common way that we see God work extraordinarily. Would you agree? Okay. Um, another way, though, that we see more often is when God does the extraordinary through the in- intervention of other people. Have you ever had a situation where uh, something's going maybe awry and somebody calls you or texts you or shows up at your door at precisely the right time? Like I've sent texts to people before going, yeah, I don't know what it means, but I was just praying and God brought you to my mind and I just wanted to text you. And then you get a phone call and you go, man, I'm sitting here in my truck with a gun. I didn't know what I was going to do. And then I got your text and then you go meet for coffee and, you know, and they live. Like, that's a, that's a miraculous thing where God uses people to intervene in the stories of, of other people. And I think we see those things more often than we see the extraordinary, miraculous things. But still, even those things we see not terribly often. They're things that we have to be in the right place or the right situation. We have to be in the right mindset to receive that direction from God or somebody else does on on our behalf. We have to be looking for it if we're going to see it, which is why I want to talk about this third thing. This is where I want to focus as we come to a close tonight. Um, Even if we never meet these extraordinary people, even if we never have an intervention from some extraordinary person that God placed in an extraordinary way where we go, wow, that was a a miracle that you called me. It was a miracle that you stopped by. Even if that doesn't happen, even if you never see somebody raised back from the dead, or limbs regrown, or any of these other things that we we, we read about in the Bible, Uh, even if we don't see those things, there's one miracle that everybody who finds their identity in Christ can look towards day after day after day, again and again and again, and it's this. God has forgiven you. God has rescued you from the depths of hell. God has taken you from your eternity separate from him and he's given you the opportunity to be reconciled to him. God has separated you from your sin to where you're not judged according to your sin any longer. You're judged according to the covering of the blood of Jesus Christ. The ordinary state of the world and of humanity is sin. The ordinary end of sin is death. The ordinary progression after death is judgment. And the ordinary verdict is guilty. And the ordinary sentence is an eternal life separated from God. That's ordinary. That's what's waiting for people who don't find their identity in Christ. But God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, did something extraordinary Uh, There's a song that draws from 2 Corinthians. It says, He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. A song called Jesus Messiah. And it means that, that God became sin on the cross. God took our death, our judgment, our verdict, and our sentence. And he did it in an extraordinary way that only he could do. He replaced death with life. He replaced a guilty verdict with an innocent one. He set aside eternal punishment and he replaced it with eternity in his presence instead. And he transformed us in the process from sinful people separate from God into the standard bearers of righteousness in this world. That's our job now. is to go live our lives in a righteous way because God has done this extraordinary thing. When we understand, when we recognize everything we've been saved from and all that we've been saved to, all of a sudden God's extraordinary presence in our lives becomes so much easier to see for what it is. Extraordinary. Our salvation 
is a miracle. And every time we turn toward that extraordinary miracle, we experience the presence of God more and more deeply. So if you want to see God working in an extraordinary way in your life, turn toward where you used to be in your sin, and then turn toward God and see what's here that didn't exist in that place. And that's, that's uh, what I want to leave you with as, as we close, with a simple practical application to this whole thing that hopefully will remind us more often of just how extraordinary God is. This is what I want you to do this week and beyond, if you would. I want you to think about who you were before God came into your life. Now, for some of you, that's going to be difficult because God came into your life at a very, very young age. And, and maybe you've never... Maybe you've never really reconciled what it's like, the, the moral and the immoral. Maybe you've, you've just kind of always been on that path, and if that's you, don't fight that. Like, I know people who are like, I just wish I had a more powerful testimony, and I'm like, no, you don't. Uh, you don't. Don't ask for that. It's like praying for patience. It's a bad idea. God will test you in that way. No, I, maybe that's you. Maybe you're somebody who accepted Christ at a very young age, and you, you go, well, I don't know who, I don't know who I'd be apart from Christ. Well, imagine it. Imagine it. Just take a moment and, and imagine it. And maybe it's, e- maybe it's tough for you because you're not yet walking that journey with Christ. Maybe you're somebody who's, who's exploring this whole thing and you're like, okay, it's really easy for me to know who I am apart from Christ because I'm not yet with Christ. That's okay. On both accounts, that's okay. The activity that I want you to do, the practical thing that I want you to do this week is to think about who you would be at your worst. And then think about who God can make you into at his best. Not your best, because his best is better than yours. So if you want to think about as good as you could possibly be on your own, great. But then imagine that God can make you ten times better. That God has a future that's a thousand times better than that thing. More importantly, even than those questions, if you imagine who you would be apart from Christ and who you would be with Christ, is to ask yourself this this question. Would that version of yourself apart from Christ be able to earn your way into the presence of God for all eternity on your own? Because if we're talking about future, if we're talking about eternity, if we're talking about God and what happens Next, that's really the most important question, isn't it? Are the good things that I do, are the moral things that I do on my own enough to compensate for my sin? Well, if the Bible is true, they're not. Which means the only compensation for our sin is the one that comes from submitting our lives to Jesus Christ. Living under the banner of his blood, becoming one of, one of God's children. Uh, our job then is to remember, we, we need to be obedient to God, living as ordinary people who make mistakes sometimes, but who are doing so because we understand just how extraordinary God is, just how much he loves us in extraordinary ways. Let's uh, recognize the presence of an extraordinary God in this place as we close our time together in prayer. God, you are extraordinary. You are extraordinary. You are beyond the ordinary. And God, it's so confusing for us to think about how extraordinary is ordinary for you. God, we know that you are great and we're thankful for your greatness. Help us to comprehend more and more every day just how extraordinary you are and just how extraordinary of a gift you've given to us through your son, Jesus Christ through his sacrifice, through his life and death, through his resurrection, through the forgiveness of sins. God, we're thankful for all of those things. God, if there's anybody here tonight that uh, has never fully turned their life over to Jesus Christ, uh, I just want to give them the opportunity to pray this prayer. Lord, I am a sinner. I know that grace is the only thing that can save me. I know that the blood of Jesus Christ offers grace and forgiveness. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Lead me.
Lord, we lift you up in this time and in this place. God, we're thankful for how extraordinary you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, last thing before I let you go, um, we are, as many of you guys know, uh, one of the primary reasons that we're working on the Madison building next door is we're trying to solve the, the issue that every pastor is trying to solve right now, which is in a post-COVID world, um, people just don't really want to come to church anymore. Like they got out of the habit of coming to church. And so we've been talking about how, um, how we can address that. And so one of the ways that we've figured out just talking with leadership over the year and a half that I've been here is that we really feel like most people prefer a Sunday morning service. Um, so don't get scared. We're not cutting things off immediately or anything like that. But that really is the prime reason that we're moving that direction is to allow the church that leases our space in the morning to move over there so that we can be here. And we'll also gain a facility there too. But um, why I'm telling you that, it's not news to most of you, um, is that we do have intentions at some point of moving primary services to the morning. We would still do something in the evening. Um, basically, it's just freeing this other church from this building, moving them to that space. And now we can do whatever we want in this space. So there wouldn't be like a cold turkey cutoff of evening services or anything like that. So I don't know exactly what that stuff looks like. But why I'm telling you that is because you're going to hear um, what a lot of people inside of Christianity feel like is a bad word. It's an M word, and it means it's marketing. Uh, we're going to be doing a bunch of marketing. Uh, we're going to put some signs up. We're going to send some mailers out. Uh, we're going to do a handful of those things to let people know that we're here. Um, I would encourage you, most people come to church because they're invited by somebody. So if you like our church, well, tell somebody about it and, uh, and bring them with you. Um, introduce them to me. I'd be happy to meet people for coffee, to talk to people, skeptics, believers, doesn't really matter. I like people. Um, I'm a people person. But one of the things, why I tell you all of that, um, is we're, uh, we printed up some stickers. Um, it's our City Church logo. And they're sitting out there on the table. And so if you would commit to, if you put this on your car or a water bottle or something like that, not acting like a jerk uh, regularly uh, <laughs> when that's in your hand, then you can take one of those. Uh, and if you're going to act like a jerk, maybe put it on somebody else's car um, that's nicer than you, uh, that you look up to. But I want to let you guys know that those are there. You can grab those if you're going to use them. Uh, we got a really sweet deal on them, so they weren't terribly expensive. Uh, so if you got two cars and you want to take two, please do that. But I just want to let you know, we are going to be talking a little bit more about what the future looks like coming into the new year, what a transition to morning services would look like, and what your role is in that, in inviting people to come and be a part of our church. Because when we tell people that our church is at 4 p.m., most people go, uh, no thanks. If it was at 10, we'd be really interested. And so we're, we're trying to mitigate that barrier a little bit. We recognize that there are some people here who are here just specifically because we meet at 4 p.m. And so um, we're still working all of it out. And you're not going to be left in the cold either. We're going to have some, some other options for you. But I want to let you know, um, grab a sticker, put it on your car, and be nice to people uh, when it's there, okay? <laughs> have a wonderful week. We'll see you next week.